All right, can folks hear me? Yeah. All right, so um, we might as well continue with the, the rest of the session. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. So basically the way we'll do it is I'll do my part first and then Alex will do, so my part will, will focus uh, more on the talent sourcing part. Alex's part will focus more on landscape startups and then we'll leave some time at the end to talk a little bit about the next session and, and help um, um, get you guys a little bit prepared for preparing uh, for, the next, uh, for the next session. Sound good to folks? All right, let's go ahead and do this. Um, look, as I said, I'm gonna focus on uh, talent sourcing, but you know, look, before we start talking about talent sourcing and we start talking about startup deal sourcing, um, it would be a mistake not to first discuss a little bit about what a startup is and what some of the unique aspects of a startup are. Because if you don't understand that, it's uh, really impossible to put yourself in the right position to, to get a bit of a sense of um, what the right talent is, what the right startups are, what a startup's needs are. You, you can't know that without <laughs> knowing what a startup is. So let me start with a definition of a startup. They're really a fundamental knowledge uh, preliminary. Um, so I've got like a definition here that I like to use. Uh, it's a dis this definition that I build uh, in my, my uh, more traditional uh, VC startups course uh, as well. But I'll give you some of these kind of like unique combination of characteristics. I think that uh, most often uh, define what it, what, it, what it means to be a startup. By the way, anything that we say, um, I think, you know, and I think Alex will second the statement I'm about to make, but pretty much anything like this that we write on a slide, you should never view it as a golden rule. You should view it as a rule of thumb. So we're always trying to give you an 80-20 on stuff. Uh, it'll always be possible to find counterexamples to what we say. Nothing is one size fits all. There's not one simple universal formula or rule for anything. Um, so just always keep that in the back of your mind whenever we present stuff. Our goal is not to present to you something that is true absolutely at all times, but it's meant to give you a pretty good 80-20 on things. And sometimes getting an 80-20 understood fast is far better than taking forever to understand something perfectly. Uh, actually, not sometimes, it's pretty much always better. Um, but in any case, um, so what do we generally mean when we talk about a startup? What are some of the um, kind of fundamental characteristics of this? Um, so to me, uh, the definition of a startup, uh, you, know, you know, there's two words. I think startup kind of combines two words, right? Start and up. The more important word is up. Because a startup to me starts with huge ambition. And so it better be that a startup has material, like large upside. Now, what does it mean to have large upside? It's a vague definition. And you ask different VCs, they'll probably give you different thresholds, right? But a common set of thresholds that I think are at least in the ballpark of, of what a lot of VCs would mention, and Alex, feel free to correct me if you disagree with this statement, but it's not unusual for VCs to say, look, it's important for a startup to be tackling an opportunity where if things work out the right way, and by the way, that's not necessarily always a high probability, but if things work out right, like all, all, all large caps, right? That the opportunity, the market that the startup is tackling, you know, generates $1 billion a year in aggregate revenue. And that the company itself, if things work out well, we see a plausible narrative where it could eventually get to $100 million a year in revenue. Now, when I say, you know, a $1 billion market, that's not necessarily the size of the initial target market of the startup, right? You know, sometimes there are startups that say, oh yeah, our, our market is the whole world, every human being now and forever into the future. You know, a startup tells that to you and doesn't give you a tactical plan for how they'll get there and doesn't seem ultra focused on the early stages of the tactical plan. That's like a hopeless endeavor. It's like tremendously naive, right? So the initial target market does not need to be large like this. And actually sometimes it's surprisingly niche, but you wanna kind of use your vision to think about the broader narrative 
And the broader narrative must be that it, like, if you can conquer that initial target market and expand it in rational ways, that you see a path to, to these thresholds, right? So view this as like more of a vague definition on upside with some rough guidance on thresholds. And Alex, do you think this is kind of in the ballpark? Yeah, one of the things we always used to look at for market was what we'd call like elbow room. Um, knowing that when you're backing an early stage company, chances are that the business that you're backing today is not the business that's going to win. Um, they're probably going to pivot one or two or three or maybe five times. Um, so what's important is, is there enough elbow room in the market so that when this company inevitably pivots, they still have space to run? If the market is so constrained where if this business model doesn't work, you're dead in the water, those are the scary opportunities. And so you're looking for a market, as Jiro said, like there, there could be an initial target that you're going after that expands into a much larger market that has a lot of elbow room knowing, okay, as we build customer bases and as we get closer to our users, we're going to learn and we're going to change the business model a few times to figure out what the end goal business model is. And there's so much space in this market to allow us to do so. Yeah. So maybe like something that's useful to add to this is you want a lot of upside, but you want a lot of optionality as well. So that like, you know, like it's not a scenario where you've only got one shot on goal. It's a scenario where you've got multiple shots and there's a lot of factors that go into multiple shots. It has to be sufficiently cheap to take one shot. And there has to be like some sense that like clearly, like if this target market doesn't work, this other target market might work, yada, yada. Yes, Joey. Um, would you consider a, a like young, fast growing company that's, that's actually cash flowing from like from early on? And that's, that's what? Sorry, that, what did you say? That's what? That generates cash flow from early on. Yeah. And that does, doesn't necessarily need equity, but can finance itself with debt. It would could that be a startup. Be considered a startup? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, being a startup does not absolutely require you to be losing money up front, although many startups do and does not require you to take venture capital. Um, if you don't need to raise the capital and uh, you, know, you may not need to raise VC, but by the way, you may not need money and still wanna raise from VC because you think the VC can bring other sources of value as well, right? So like, you know, yeah, I would say the upside is the key thing, right? Um, um, you know, whether you're making money or not early on, you know, there's, there's not a hard and fast rule there. Usually they're losing money early on. Um, um, and again, like it's not absolutely necessary for you to raise VC. And sometimes the onus is on the VC to like make the case for why they're sufficiently valuable um, that the startup should take money from them even though they don't technically need the money right now. And by the way, plenty of VCs end up successfully doing that. Uh, if you look at Sequoia, Sequoia made uh, an investment in WhatsApp when WhatsApp actually didn't need their money short term. And actually, when WhatsApp got acquired by, um, by Facebook for $19 billion, um, they had not spent the Sequoia money that they had received, right? But Sequoia was useful to them in other ways. Among other things, gave them credibility, gave them contacts and, 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 and relationships into Facebook, for instance, and stuff like that. Um, so in any case, um, uh, yeah, so it starts with upside. Um, Alex also, by talking about multiple shots on goal, um, uh, or uh, you call it elbow room, I like the term, um, you know, highlighted something that is another core part of the definition of a startup, which is uh, uh, startups oftentimes start under conditions of extreme uncertainty. Um, there's one practitioner that, that once quoted to me, said, look, you know, a startup early stage is a company that is confused about uh, who their customer is, what their product is, and how they'll make money. Uh, sometimes that's actually uh, accurate, um, which is about as much uncertainty as I can imagine to some extent. Um, and so there's a large amount of core uncertainty on pretty fundamental um, uh, elements of a business. Uh, if I wanna kind of uh, divide up the uncertainty into a few forms, uh, you've got product uncertainty what to produce. Is it possible to produce it? Is the production of the product or service scalable? There's beachhead market uncertainty. So the beachhead market is your initial target market. Who will you initially sell to? 
There's go-to-market uncertainty. How do you actually reach the buyers? Because once you have a product that the target market wants, they don't automatically know that you're offering a nice value proposition. How do you get them aware of that? Right? So how to reach buyers? And is your go-to-market strategy the combination of marketing and sales channel, marketing and sales message, um, pricing, um, customer success uh, actions? Or is that nexus of stuff uh, scalable and profitable? You got to figure that out. You got to resolve that uncertainty. That's go to market uncertainty. And then there's market expansion uncertainty. You got something that works. You're able to sell uh, dog food to poodles uh, in Canada. Um, how do you figure out how to sell that, you know, do that dog food or a, an altered version of that dog food to poodles in, um, in uh, France? Um, how do you sell to poodles in the US? Uh, how do you? Um, how do you sell to, uh, what? I, I, okay, I'm not a dog owner. I should probably, the reason why I said the dog analogy is because of Andy Reckleff. Um, um, he's a famous VC, uh, Alex, no, yeah, uh, Alex is very familiar with him. Um, so what's another kind of dog? What's, what's your dog type? Golden doodle. A golden doodle. Like how do you sell to golden doodles? And uh, uh, well, I, I, by the way, my dog, I, I, I sent him to my, it was my father's dog. I sent him to my sister. Uh, I guess he was a, what is it? A Boston Terrier? Oh man, it's really bad. I was a bad dog owner. Um, so uh, yeah, right. How do you expand, right? And how far can you go? It's like Facebook, you know, was initially as a target market, college students at prestigious universities in the US, then college students everywhere in the US, then college, high school and parents in the US, then like eventually like a lot of the world, right? How do you expand these things, right? And how far can you go? That's, there's uncertainty there too. Another aspect about startups is almost all of them start poor, right? They are resource constrained and they have to figure a lot of shit out. They're poor in terms of money, financial capital, but also human capital, finite human resources. They're a team of two to three people trying to kind of resolve the core early stages of uncertainty. That means they're spread thin. And consequently, well-run startups need to resolve this uncertainty in an efficient way. They need to prioritize resolving some forms of uncertainty first quickly and cheaply. Uh, do you want to add something, uh, Alex? No, it's it's just funny that I'm, I'm working at a series B, C stage company with over a hundred million dollars in the bank and we're still confused about all these things. <laughs> so it's- uh, Some it things really are working. <laughs> <laughs> Some things are working, but but um, when, you, when you use that analogy of confused about your customer and confused about your market and confused about how you make money, um, I think um, it takes a long time as a startup to figure those things out. It's it's not something you're gonna you're gonna solve in a year. That's right. And by the way, you'll be continuously resolving these problems, new versions of them as you expand. So, like you figure out how to make something kind of work in Montreal and in Toronto, and then you try to figure out how to make it work in Boston. It's not the same thing. So you're constantly, you know, uh, trying to figure new things out. Um, but you're right, like you never fully figure out anything. Let's all be realistic with ourselves, right? So, and then another, right? So uh, they start poor, so they need to think about this. And then there's the question of defensibility. A good startup better be defensible. So that if a startup is successful in uh, de-risking an opportunity by showing they've got the right product, selling it to the right market and have an effective way to sell it there that is profitable, that once this becomes known to the rest of the market, other people can't come and take the lunch. So you need to have long run barriers to competition. And actually the long run here is usually important because while Joey highlighted that a startup can be profitable early on, um, oftentimes it is not. And so if you're losing money in the short term, you better be pretty profitable in the long term or else the NPV don't work, right? Um, yes, Youssef. Yeah, so I just had a, a quick question. So when a startup exits, like is solving these problems a condition of a startup like exiting to potentially IPO or acquire something? Or is this something that will just like last that investors decide they're comfortable with just in public markets like eventually? So like is solving this the ultimate goal of a startup? Or is this just going to be a condition of doing business forever? I mean, Alex, you want to answer that question? 
Um, yeah, start startups loss loss startups that lose money. Um, back to Joey's point because that's not every startup. Startups that lose money operate in this really weird cycle where you know by definition because you're losing money you need to raise capital every year. And so I can always forecast when I need to raise capital again based on how much money I'm spending and how much money I'm losing. So if I know that I need to raise capital again in 12 months, what I'm optimizing for as an entrepreneur and as a management team is do the necessary steps, some of which are on this slide, to allow me to sell my story in 12 months to another investor. Because if I don't sell my story in another 12 months to another investor, I'm dead. So what ends up happening there is entrepreneurs in companies that lose a lot of money end up in these very short-term cycles where they optimize for short-term short and mid-term decision-making to allow them to continue to survive. That's not always the best way to build a business because some of those short-term decisions end up really hurting you long-term. For example, product and technology, you don't get benefit from investing in those things tomorrow. Those things take time to build. You need to hire engineers. You need to develop, develop roadmaps. And so what ends up happening with a lot of startups is they're super scrappy and they're super operational because they need things that move the needle immediately because if they don't move the needle, needle immediately, they don't contribute to your next round of funding. And if you don't contribute to your next round of funding, you're dead. So the term that's used often is like default dead. And there's this interesting transition in a startup's life where you go from default dead to default alive. And that's when you've passed this threshold of having enough capital in the bank or having enough visibility into profitability where you can start optimizing for long-term decisions and figuring out what matters to get you to exit and IPO and all those other things. So I know I'm not exactly answering the question, but that's the sort of operating considerations that you have is always, what is my next milestone for capital? Or what is my next milestone for profitability that allows me to become default alive? And so I, then I can start making the right decisions for my business. Yeah. And by the way, like in terms of the question relating to like what you need to achieve to have exit be realistic, that actually varies over time, depending on market conditions. Right. So like with the recent rise in SPACs, like the ability to exit fairly quickly for some companies um, has become an has become a bit of an option that wasn't there for an extended period of time, almost basically for like 15 to 20 years after the dot-com bubble burst, right? Um, partially as a reaction to people getting burned uh, during the dot-com bubble. Um, so these things ebb and flow on the basis of market conditions. So it's kind of, you know, there isn't really a, uh, a timeless answer to your question um, uh, in, in that particular way. But in some sense, what, what Alex just mentioned is in some sense a more timeless principle that relates to that question. Um, so awesome. uh, yeah. Um, right. So, you know, this is, look, I want to emphasize, this is a pretty unique combination of characteristics for companies. Very few companies have all of these, have all of these aspects, right? And this unique combination of characteristics leads to a unique life cycle and journey for a startup compared to most companies, both, um, uh, other kind of less upside, less uncertainty, magnified uh, entrepreneurial ventures. Think small and medium um, uh, entrepreneurial uh, uh, ventures, right? Um, or like more mature companies that are large, right? Um, you know, the, the, the day of the life of a startup is very different than both of those entities. Um, and the day of the life in a startup, there's some aspects of it that like evolve and change over time. Um, and so, you know, one thing that I like to talk about with startups is, is the life cycle of a startup. And, and look, um, uh, Alex will have a, 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 a more nuanced appreciation of the realities of a startup on a day-to-day. -day. And there's no doubt that what I'm saying is an oversimplification, right? So view this as, again, as an 80-20. But, you know, if I think of the life cycle of a startups early on, because there's all this crazy uncertainty, the ideal is that the startup is set up to efficiently resolve the uncertainty. And so you wanna prioritize which types of uncertainty can you de-risk and resolve first? Which ones should you try to resolve first? You know, in ideal circumstances, you should try to resolve product uncertainty and beachhead market uncertainty before you actually try to resolve go-to-market uncertainty. 
You need to establish that you have a legitimate value proposition before you try to achieve a growth proposition. Because if you try to achieve growth, but your dog food is shit, good luck with that. You need to make sure you've got tasty dog food before you start trying to like pay money to present it to a bunch of poodles, right? Um, so make sense to tackle this, the combination of these two uncertainties before you invest too much in tackling this. And only once you have a growth proposition that combines a value prop and clarity on how to predictably scale, ideally in a profitable way, only then should you start aggressively spending money in actually scaling to the max. Because or else, you know, look, it's easy to grow if you are selling a quarter for a nickel. Um, but that ain't taking you anywhere good. Because that's what we call a negative NPV project. Um, so you need to make sure that customer acquisition is positive NPV before you start going bonkers acquiring customers. Like, look, sometimes it's not as clean as that because of competitive pressures and stuff like that. So sometimes you don't try to solve this uncertainty. I call solving this, this well, I don't call it. Andy Reckleff, the person we mentioned before, is the person who popularized the term. He was one of the founding partners of uh, Benchmark, which is another one of the most famous VC firms in the world. Uh, but resolving these two things, you can call that product market fit or, or establishing a value proposition. Resolving go-to-market uncertainty is finding go-to-market fit, at least in your, tar in your initial target markets. And then once you do that, then you start aggressively scaling in the sense that you rinse, repeat, rinse, repeat on the stuff that you figured out works. But while you are rinse, repeat, rinse, repeat on the stuff that works, that's like an execution focused thing. You are also trying to find other, sorry about that, other ways to grow. In other words, you are still trying to figure out new things so that you can scale even more. And so in this phase, you are still a little bit confused, even in ideal circumstances, on who your customer is, what you're producing, and how to make money, because you're trying to find other ways to create value. And so this aggressive scaling phase, actually, interestingly enough, has kind of two things going on. An execution phase, where you're doing the stuff that you figured out works, and miniature, well, miniature, sometimes not so miniature, but like new versions of figuring stuff out again so that you can find other ways to grow. So like, you know, these two phases tend to be super experimental. You're, you're honestly like, to some extent, uh, sometimes more focused on learning than on earning. Whereas once you get to this stage, you're focused on earning on the stuff you know works and you're focusing on learning on the other stuff that you hope will give you even more earnings down the road because you, you need to do that other stuff to achieve the upside as well, because usually your early markets are not large enough to, 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 to feed your ambition, the upside that you want. And to me, that's kind of what the life cycle of startups looks like. And so the point is here, there's a lot of experimentation, right? And then there's a phase in the life of a startup where things change, where now you need to kind of grow up a little bit and also execute. Right. Um, and so startups tend to change a lot here. They tend to raise a lot more money here. And startups need to be really nimble and learning here. And they still need to be nimble and learning here in some way as well. And so you need to know those core things because that starts to tell you what sort of people you need in these organizations. And to some extent, how do the needs in terms of people and resources change once you navigate from here to here to here? Because the people a startup need actually you know, do sometimes change non-negligibly over the life of a startup. That's why you actually have some people who are super valuable, but who hop from one startup to the next because they're particularly valuable early on. And so understanding that tells you what sort of talent you're looking for. And so hopefully, you know, this is a very like quick 80-20, uh, but I think it's important to internalize some of these statements uh, and some of these observations before you even think about any sort of sourcing, either, you know, talent, you know, or, uh, or startups deals, right? So let's talk a little bit about talent sourcing. Um, I have in my slides, a framework 
for evaluating people. But when I say people here, I really mean founding teams. In the interest of time, I will not present this in today's lecture. What I will do instead is I will give you guys a YouTube video, a link to a YouTube video, where I actually present this. Okay, because I want to give Alex his time to present his stuff as well. Um, but you know, this is a framework. It's a framework that was obtained by aggregating the opinions and perspectives of many investors, but by no means is this a golden framework either, right? But this is a framework that I like to use. Uh, so I'll share the video and if you guys want, you guys can check it out. My view is there's value to checking it out at some point. If you have already taken my VC course or are currently taking it, I will be covering this in one of my lectures, all right? Uh, if you want a quicker version of this, because my video here will be like almost an hour. If you want a five minute version of it from someone way smarter and more accomplished than me, uh, there's a video here of an interview by Peter Fenton, where he talks about some of the most important sub elements of this framework that he emphasizes the most. But what you'll see is there's a lot of overlap between what he says and what I've listed here. Uh, Peter Fenton is the main partner at Benchmark Capital now. I mean, Benchmark is a legendary VC firm in so he many is, He is one of my favorite VCs to listen to. Any content you can find on Peter Fenton is usually extremely interesting. I mean- He doesn't have a lot of content though. That's right. He is a quality over quantity person for sure. But I mean, like you listen to him talk and honestly, it's pretty, it's pretty impressive the way his mind works. He breaks things down in a super like effective first principle way. And you can also tell just by hearing him talk that he builds trust with the, with the, 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 the entrepreneurs he partners with like big time. Uh, I mean, it is really remarkable. So he's definitely a person uh, you should keep track of. But as Alex says, there's not a ton of content, um, but there's enough that there's a lot to be learned from him. Um, so yeah, look, I mean, my point here is you, you wanna have a framework for evaluating people, a framework for evaluating startups, because it tells you what deals you should be interested in sourcing and which talent you should be interested in looping into your network so as to make you a more credible adder of value to portfolio companies and to help you know who should be on your radar that might be an interesting founder uh, in the future as well. And so this brings forth this question of networking. And so like networking is important, but you also want to think about networking beyond founders. Uh, I emphasize founders in this uh, framework. Uh, by the way, it's called F and Good Boss because I kind of took letters for each of the key elements to check out. And I kind of uh, rejigged everything to make it an acronym. But anyway, people, nerds like to do that, right? Um, so, um, so you know, it's also important to think like, look, it's not just about founders. Founders are fundamentally important to the startup ecosystem. Uh, but when you're thinking about talent sourcing, it's not just founders. There's a bunch of other folks you want to um, have to, to source as well. You want to source startup operators. So these are employees, but that are not founders within startups or portfolio companies, right? So this can include things like key executives, CFO, a head of finance, COO, CMO, head of growth, the chief of staff, right? Who are the folks, like, can you find the folks that might be interesting talent that can serve roles like this or can serve technical roles, you know, be technical talent, you know, even like software developers, you know, those folks are hard to find and hard to recruit in a startup. How can you as a VC be aware of the talent and help navigate it towards the companies you have an economic interest in or that you're hoping to get an economic interest in? So you must source operators. You also want to think about sourcing future founders. So it's not just about finding the founders who are already, the people who are already founders that you think are promising. It might be more important for you to find the folks who will become a founder in one year, in three years, because now you have an opportunity to form a relationship with them now so that when they're ready to raise money or ready to start something, you are in a prime position. Industry experts, talent that is also important to source. Folks that can be advisors to you um, and help you out when you're doing due diligence 
or trying to learn about an emerging trend, you know, a technology trend, a regulatory trend, a scientific development, or help you learn important facts and constraints and challenges in an industry that you're interested in investing in. These things are hugely important because you don't know everything. Uh, let me tell you something about every human being in the world. Every human being in the world knows approximately nothing. No matter how smart you are and no matter how much you try to learn, the, the number of facts you know divided by the total number of facts out there will always be very close to zero. So the way to get above zero is to have a nice dense network that covers you on areas you don't know. Industry experts, fundamental for that. Uh, board members and miscellaneous advisors. Whoops, I realized I didn't finish my sentence there. But I think you guys know what board members and advisors are and why they can be helpful. Um, you know, beyond this, uh, these inputs, like, right, these kind of human capital inputs, there's also folks that can be helpful in um, uh, financial inputs, right? So co-investors, but co-investors are more helpful than just like helping you be able to invest more money by co-investing with you. Uh, they can help you um, by, you know, also helping you with learning, but also um, by, um, by, you know, making you more credible, by looping you in to some of the stuff that they source. Hugely important, right? Um, and then finally, you know, um, your network on limited partners is important too. Limited partners, uh, if you're a VC, they're the investors in your fund, right? So you want to source and develop relationships with the investors in your fund and potentially new LPs as well. So when, you, when I think about talent sourcing, I think about all these different forms of talents uh, and founders, current founders. And so remember to think flexibly about what it means to be talent. Is anyone that can help make you more successful in your activities in the space and help your, and that's really about helping make your companies more, the companies you invest in uh, more successful and helping you pick better companies to bet on and helping you be aware of those things. So hugely important. Um, by the way, um, you know, this framework that I have here, there's one thing that's kind of missing from this framework, um, but that I think for like these non-founder roles is really important. I'd be curious actually to what extent you agree with me, Alex, but I think you'll, I suspect you'll agree. Um, which is like for some of these non-founder roles, you know, openness and generosity matters a lot. Like how generous are they with their time and how open are they in sharing their knowledge with you or with a, comp with a, with a portfolio company? Uh, some people are very open, some people aren't. Uh, it's the folks that are open, you know, not open just with their knowledge, but also open with their network. This is one where I see so much variation in practice. Some folks, when I tell them I'm trying to learn about something and they don't know it, but they know someone who know it, they like almost always say, hey, I know this person, I'll put you in touch with them. Like those people are gold. If they've got a deep network and they loop you into that network, like those are the people that I, in my experience, I've benefited the most from. Um, and meanwhile, some people, you know, they, they treat their network as, as their asset and they protect it with like, you know, a fortress. And they never tell you who the, the folks they know is, or they'll tell you, but they won't, they won't connect you, right? Um, you know, those folks are at the margin holding all else equal, substantially less valuable. Now with founders, it's a little bit less obvious whether you want them to be open and generous like that. Uh, because at the end of the day, being open and generous can mean that you get more easily spread thin. You don't have enough focus because you want to help others all the time. And you might be less effective at protecting value. So, you know, this is one where it's a little bit debatable, much more debatable to me, whether this is good for founders, a good trait for founders, but for the other supporters of an ecosystem, to me, like almost like essential. Alex, would you generally agree with that? Absolutely. And as I, as I shared before, from my experience, more people fall into the open and generous bucket in this environment. Um, I would say most people that are in the startup and VC environment are unqualified for the jobs that they're in. And they're in those jobs because other people were generous to them with their networks and were open in, in upskilling them. So 
Um, a lot of people have the same experience of, of working through the working and scrapping and hustling their way through the ranks and they're, um, they want to help other people do the same thing. Yeah. And by the way, if you have a reputation for being helpful and generous, uh, you will probably um, have people come to you that are interesting opportunities. And so, you know, that might be, you know, a more valuable asset than protecting all your, you know, all this stuff in the first place. Right. So an interesting, right. So in, in some sense, it also says like, it's probably a good idea for you to have a bit of a different mindset around openness and generosity. If you're going to be operating in the startup ecosystem, than if you're going to be operating, um, you know, um, as a, you know, uh, as an investment banker somewhere, um, you know, providing financial advisory to like a, a mining company. Um, so, so, you know, useful, useful to note and look, you know, different personality types, right? At the end of the day, it's useful to know who you are and to optimize around that. Um, I've got some blanks here. You'll notice I'm not giving answers because another thing that I want to highlight about this course is that for some things, our goal is not going to be to give you answers. It's going to be to ask questions. So to be more question provoking than answer provoking. So another thing for you to ask is like, can you think of anything else that you think is important in terms of these frameworks? And then you can ask like, well, that stuff, I think it's important for what types of startups or for what types of support players in the startup ecosystem do I think these alternatives are particularly important? Because another thing that's an important question to ask, but actually a very difficult question to answer, certainly in a general way, is how do you weigh a given framework um, and how do the weights vary across various roles or across various industries, yada, yada. So I'm not going to attempt to answer this tonight. Um, and by the way, there's a lot of context where I don't have an answer anyway. So like, you know, it is what it is. Uh, but I do know that this is important to formulate opinions on. Uh, because if you're looking for someone who is amazing in absolutely every dimension of this framework, uh, you will probably wait forever. And the one thing I know is that an investor who never invests is not a very good investor. And by the way, within all of this, uh, VC self-awareness matters. Uh, it matters a lot and it plays a role in determining what you focus on and how you position yourself. Because how you position yourself is gonna govern who you interact with. And if you're interacting with the wrong people who don't need what you have to offer, it ain't going to work so well. So self-awareness is important. On networking, again, more question provoking than answer provoking. You know, questions are, are surround, you know, where to look. Should you take a transactional versus a relational perspective? I mean, the answer there is usually relational. Um, transactional means very short term, right? Um, do you focus on short term versus long term? Things like, are you looking for someone who's going to be a founder in a year? Or are you cool with like paying attention to someone who might be five years away to becoming a founder? If they're five years away, can you help nudge that a little bit or get help better train them by referring them to startup roles that will serve as good training for them, right? You, you start thinking about all these things. Like it may not pay off directly in the short term, but in the long term, it might, it might be, you know, particularly interesting. So the short term versus the long term of it all is an open question. And by the way, different, different VCs will take a different perspective there. I mean, if you're a VC that's concerned about raising your next fund and you're going to try to raise your next fund in two years, you might be a little bit more short term. And you know, that's not necessarily the wrong thing to do. So you want to think a little bit situationally about these things. Uh, when you're building a network, you know, not every network node is the same. You've got some near, near orbits that are the people that you focus on preserving the tightest links with. And then you've got progressively further orbits. Not every network node is the same. Have, have, have an opinion on it. You know, who do you reach out to every month? Who do you reach out to um, once a quarter? Who do you reach out to once a year? Like to me, that seems relevant. And a lot of folks that I've talked to that I respect a lot and oftentimes communicate things a little bit in this manner as well. They have, an, they have a clear opinion on who the, folk, who, who the closest people to them in their network is and, and progressively who's a little bit further. And it's not to say that the people that are far are not good. It's just like a question of match, right? 
And then there's this question of give versus take. Well, ideally, you'd like to focus on win-wins. And that requires you to know your connections, motivations, their goals, et cetera. It's not just about you. It's a community. It's not, you're, you're not the center of the universe and neither are they. So, you know, the ideal is, is relationships that are win-win because those are the ones that, that are likely to, to be most aligned. Uh, again, on answering these question, um, um, not really the focus in many parts of the course on, on providing answers because I, you know one of the main reasons is answers are not one size fits all. And the right answer depends on you. And we don't know you, so we're, it's better to make you equipped to answer it for yourself in a way that is attuned to you uh, than it is to give an answer that you know, may be more reflective about us uh, where we don't even pretend to have the right answer for ourselves at this stage, right? And these answers kind of change over time. So a lot of this is more about, you know, um, um, asking the right questions sometimes than, than providing a legit answer. Uh, I mean, actually like the YouTube videos that we'll post, I've already posted some informal like speaker events that I've done in the past. And the, the YouTube playlist that, that I put all these videos in is called questions as a service. It's a play on software as a service. Um, but the reason why I call it questions as a service is because that's really what I view the speaker, the speaker series about. It's about asking the right questions to help you learn and, um, and to put you in a position to learn more effectively. And, and I think that's more valuable. Um, folks are welcome to comment on whether they like that or not. Um, you know, if you, if you believe like there aren't enough concrete answers provided in the course, uh, we certainly would like to know not sure what we can do about it, but like um, um, useful, useful to know what student preferences center around. And then finally, one last thing that I'll say, and then I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll let uh, Alex, uh, Alex take over, um, is, uh, is an observation on uh, uh, beyond networking, on advising and adding value. And this is pretty short because it's pretty obvious. Uh, fundamental building blocks for being a good advisor and for credibly being able to tell uh, um, a startup or, or a founder that you can help add value beyond the money you give them, fundamentally include being effective at learning by conversation and having a great network. So both personalities of the course are fundamental here, right? So I'll leave it at that, I think. Yep, I'll leave it at that. The last slide is actually someone who used to be my housemate. I won't talk about that today. Uh, although he's one of the best uh, people at sizing up talent that I have ever met in my life. Um, but uh, but I'll, I'll, let, I'll let Alex take it over from here. So Alex, you should be able to share your screen. I'll stop my share now. Jiro, do you want to pause for two seconds in case there are any questions or thoughts there? Yeah, that's probably a good idea. You want any questions? By the way, you guys can always just ask away. Okay, like that is encouraged. But, uh, but yeah, if anyone has any questions, I know we went fast, but, uh, but, but, but feel, free, feel free to chime in. I guess maybe not, maybe, may, I guess we can, we can go to you. Maybe, maybe it's getting a little bit past people's bedtime. It's actually getting pretty close to mine because I did say that I wake up at 4 a.m. Yeah, I've been on back-to-back -back Zoom calls since like <laughs> 7.30 this morning, but um, this is fun. Um, maybe it's useful for two seconds if I if I go a little bit deeper into my background, just so that um, you guys can understand in the course um, where I can be valuable and where I can't, and where I might be able to help in either one on one sessions or during the class. So I'm, as Jiro mentioned, I'm a McGill grad. I graduated from Days Hotel with a, a accounting and finance degree. Um, I thought I was going to be an auditor, so I went and did an internship at, at Deloitte and audit, and absolutely hated it. <laughs> it wasn't for me. Um, so quickly pivoted out of that. And I went and did a, a master's in finance from the London School of Economics, um, came back and worked as a consultant for a couple of years at Accenture, which was uh, which is a digital consulting firm that, that focuses more on technology than it does on strategy consulting. Um, that was the first time in my life that I started learning about technology and, and the considerations that go into implementing technology and, and the way it works inside organizations. Um, they were much larger. Wait, are you saying first time in your life? Didn't you take my VC course? 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I, I don't actually mean um, investing in technology or whatever. I mean, like actual like tech implementation, like doing QA testing, doing like, um, like really getting in the weeds of, of what like software looks like. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and so I, I came out of Accenture feeling like uh, a big firm wasn't for me. Um, I'm really motivated by like building things myself and by being super autonomous and by um, and, you know, really just feeling like I have an impact on the company that I'm working at. And so I thought that a small firm was going to be a lot more beneficial um, for from, from my style. So I, I joined Inovia. Um, at the time, Inovia was a really small fund. Uh, we were like 12 people or something. We were only an early stage fund. We had, you know, a couple hundred million dollars under management, but nothing really um, of note. Um, throughout my five years there, it was an absolutely unbelievable experience. We raised a few billion dollars of capital across both early and growth stage investing. We hired some unbelievable partners, including Patrick Pichette, who was the ex-CFO of Google, Dennis Cavillman, who was the ex-CFO of BlackBerry, um, Steve Woods, who was, the, uh, who was a uh, technical leader at Google in Canada, um, and just some unbelievable people that I got the, the pleasure of working with and learning from. Um, throughout that time, I was an investor on our early stage team. I led about uh, a dozen investments. I sat on the board of six or seven companies, um, including companies like ClearBank, Reno Run, um, Alaya Care, um, and a, a number of others. Um, was involved uh, in doing deals like Wealth Simple. Was involved in companies like uh, Lightspeed. Um, and just had a tremendous experience learning alongside some of the best entrepreneurs across Canada and the U.S. Um, I would say when I joined the fund and started interacting with people like Andrew at ClearBank or Mike at Well Simple, like these are people that were extremely uh, daunting for me to feel like I was in the same room as. Um, and throughout my five years, I gained a lot of confidence in, in the way that I speak to those individuals and, and the value that I think that I can bring to them uh, and found my own personal brand. Um, I wanted to be um, an operator myself. Um, I felt more, actually after five years, I, I felt more aligned with most of the entrepreneurs that I spent my time with than I did with the investors. And that's just a personal preference. So I decided to join uh, a company that I had invested in two years prior and had spent two years on the board of as the chief of staff. Um, it's a company called Reno Run. Um, essentially, we're building, a, uh, we're building Amazon for construction. So we can deliver construction materials to job sites through a fully a digital e-commerce experience in a couple of hours. So a builder can order a thousand sheets of drywall across town and we'll get it there um, through, a, through a digitally enabled experience. We operate our own warehouses. We manage our own inventory and supply chain. We have our own vehicles that you may see around Montreal, our own drivers that we employ. And uh, we're expanding rapidly. We're in uh, five cities right now, uh, launching quickly across the US with a new city every couple of months. Um, and my role as chief of staff is a really interesting one. Um, I was kind of able to craft the role myself with the things that I really wanted to spend time doing. And so my primary responsibility is building the operating system of the company, which means how do we make decisions? How do we manage uh, teams? How do we work together as an executive team? How do we disseminate information across the company? Um, we have about 400 and 50 employees now. And so the actual internal operating system of a company that has 450 employees across a number of cities is actually really challenging. <laughs> and so it's stuff that I'm spending a lot of time learning about. I'm speaking to my network, to Jiro's whole point in this presentation that he just gave. All of my learning and all of the things that I'm implementing at Reno Run are things that I'm learning by speaking to other people. Um, I'm talking to former founders, former chief of staffs, um, executive coaches, um, other startups, other entrepreneurs, and I'm consolidating all that information from the people that I'm speaking to, and I'm trying to implement the things that I think matter most and, and will drive the most value to our company. Um, I also lead fundraising and investor relations. We raised a $140 million Series B round, uh, which I led in the second half of last year, which actually hasn't been announced publicly yet. Um, so um, keep it in this room. Um, and uh, I lead data and analytics. So how we use data to drive decisions as a company. And I also lead executive hiring. Uh, so we're hiring five um, C-level and VP-level roles right now across different stages of our different, different areas of our company. So that, that's, that's my role. I manage a team of people that, that help me accomplish those goals. And I report directly to the CEO, who I'm hoping that will, uh, will come to this class at some point in the semester and share his story with you. Um, so that's a bit about me. I can help with, um, with um, 
career considerations. I've spent a lot of time thinking about career and what a career means. I'm a big fan of the non-linear career path, despite my my career path so far seeming somewhat linear, like jumping from finance to consulting to VC. Uh, I think I'm going to deconstruct that over the next couple of decades, and I'm going to do some crazy stuff that's not linear at all and that doesn't follow the traditional model. So I'm a big fan of helping people think through those things. Um, I know a lot about the VC world. As Jiro said, I probably know next to zero in the large scheme of things, but I have a lot of experience and emotion and things that I've gone through along the way. And um, I'm good at networking. Um, I've, I've been able to build a good personal brand that's allowed me to get in some pretty cool rooms. And I, I think I can help on a lot of the things that Jiro just talked about in, in this presentation. Um, that being said, let me walk you through a short thing. I'll try to keep this quick um, so that we can end a few minutes early. Um, my presentation deck is uh, looks like it was built by an elementary school um, <laughs> student. It doesn't look anywhere near as good as Jiro does. Um, I was telling Jiro in advance, my view on building presentation decks is there's, there's two ways to do it. Either you don't put any effort at all, <laughs> which is the approach I took, or you get it designed and you do it actually right because anywhere in the middle doesn't really, if I design it myself, it's just not going to work. So it's a series of white backgrounds and black text. Um, the value will not be in the slide deck. My method of communication for this will be um, verbal. <laughs> so let me share my screen and I'll try to keep this to, uh, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes here. Um, all right, can you see my screen? All right. I titled this presentation, Young, Wild, and Free. And no, I'm not referring to my days as a student at McGill. I'm referring to the current state of private capital markets um, because they really are absolutely wild right now. And we're in completely unprecedented times for um, the startup ecosystem, for the life of a founder, and for the life of a VC. Does anybody recognize either of these two fine gentlemen? <laughs> Any uh, any guesses, Victoria? That's Ashton Kutcher. Yeah, and what about what about the other man? No clue. <laughs> yeah, I don't know his name, but it's the WeWork guy. Yeah, so that's that's Adam Newman. Um, he is the founder. He was the CEO. He'll always be the founder of of WeWork. Um, he uh, he married. Um, into uh, Gwyneth Paltrow's family, I think her sister, and quickly uh, started getting into the uh, ranks of, of fame by meeting a whole bunch of cool Hollywood and New York rich people um, that he built his network off of. Essentially, the way I'm going to run this short presentation is to just tell three quick stories, very, very quick stories. The story of WeWork is an absolutely crazy one. Um, there's a book called The Cult of We, which is one of the craziest books <laughs> I've read in recent memory, which basically details the rise and fall of this company. Um, WeWork at one point um, was worth $47 billion um, and had raised between 10 and $15 billion of venture capital financing. Um, this is the chart uh, that, I, that I found on, on Google somewhere, but this is the chart here of WeWork's valuation by funding round. So between 2009 and 2019, this company basically went from nothing uh, to Jiro's points around solving a bunch of uncertainties to SoftBank valuing this company at nearly $50 billion. Um, if you take a step back and think about what WeWork is as a business, WeWork is a real estate company. It leases out space in an office building. It puts in some dollars of renovation to make it look a little sexier, some, some nice glass, um, a couple of meeting rooms, a vending machine, some beer taps. And then it divides up the space and it releases it to a bunch of, to a bunch of startups, businesses, professional service firms. Um, and in the process of doing so, hopefully it makes money. So it might lease a, a floor for $10,000, put a couple hundred thousand dollars of, of work into it, and then release it for maybe $15,000 a month this, the, divided amongst you know, all these micro tenants. Um, Adam Newman didn't pitch it as a real estate company. Adam Newman pitched this business as a tech company. And the reason why he pitched it as a tech company was so that he could get the interest of venture capitalists um, to be able to raise capital. Um, he was addicted to raising capital. He was addicting, addicted to talking to VC firms. 
And he didn't need, he didn't only raise capital from VC firms. He started off with the likes of Excel and you know Benchmark and some other really really well known venture firms that basically only invested because of his own charisma. He was again selling a real estate firm as a tech company, but he still raised early stage venture capital. As he started developing traction, he raised uh, he got a ten billion dollar check from Massa Sun at SoftBank. Um, SoftBank is a really interesting firm to dig into and, and research a little bit more. Um, but he also got checks. Uh, into this, into this company from Fidelity, um, Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, T. Rowe Price. And the question here begs, why are a bunch of mutual funds and investment banks and some of the largest banks in the country putting uh, dollars into a real estate firm run by a guy with no experience at a $47 billion valuation? So that's story number one. Um, and if you want to learn more about WeWork and go in more into detail on all of that, this is a widely documented story that is all over the internet on, on various posts and books. The second story here, um, and most of you may recognize him, is a famous NBA basketball player, Steph Curry, um, probably one of the best uh, shooters of, of all time, um, definitely a Hall of Famer, um, several time um, NBA uh, champion. Um, Steph Curry also does a lot of stuff off the basketball court, um, one of which is he's a venture capitalist, um, which is really interesting. Um, he actually backed a company um, in the Inovia portfolio, which you can see in the image down here. Steph Curry buys into Snap Travel, which is a company that I had the, the pleasure of working a little bit on that's based out of, uh, out of Ontario. He also invested in Pinterest, Slice, Palm, Brandless, um, and he actually raised the fund, uh, his own venture capital fund, where he uh, deploys his own capital and actually has a few LPs that he invests in. So that's story number two. And story number three, um, weirdly enough, is about a mattress. Um, and somehow this mattress in a box is a tech company um, that is, instead of a mattress, the global sleep company that actually IPO'd on the New York Stock Exchange. Um, and again, this is similar to the WeWork story. This was not sold to venture capitalists as a mattress. This was sold as you know, disrupting sleep um, and all the things that they were gonna build around how to disrupt sleep. This is a physical mattress that's put in a box and shipped in the mail. And venture capital firms, I know this is blurry, I'm not really sure why. Venture capital firms own 30% of this company. Um, so what's the point of talking about all of this? Well, if we take a step back and think back to the title of the presentation of Young, Wild and Free, why is a mutual fund like Fidelity funding a cash burning real estate company without doing any due diligence? Why is an NBA player raising a venture fund? And how did a mattress become a technology company? This speaks to the current state of the private capital markets. It is wild. Um, <laughs> With more capital in the market, and I'll walk through a couple of facts in a second, but with more capital in the market than ever, with more competition from more types of funds than ever, um, people and firms are looking for any angle they can get, essentially. So they're backing more growth stage companies that are burning more cash and that contain more risk. They're backing companies that aren't even tech companies in the hopes that one day they may do something tech related. Um, and you've got so many players from so many different areas of the market penetrating at once into this category. Um, Jiro, any thoughts on, on any of that or anything to add? I mean, I think a first order uh, question to ask off of this, although I don't think we necessarily want to emphasize on answering this right now, is in a situation like this, um, what are your concerns about the state of this market uh, you know, in a one to five year horizon uh, and how might that impact everything around the ecosystem down the road. But that's a uh, uh, pretty complicated nut to crack. Uh, so I'm not sure, not sure you want to give a, a, a quick 80-20 on that. Uh, but that's something that I think about in addition, I think, to the issues you're going to talk about uh, when I look at this trend um, uh, to be continued, I guess. I see a few hands up. Uh, yep. I think maybe, well, let's go with Matt first and, and, then, and then Joey second. Go ahead, Matt. 
Hi, thanks. Um, I was just curious because you're speaking here about a lot about investor sentiment, um, whether it's, I'm, I'm curious how that filters through into the private markets and, and how that sort of differs from the public markets, because, you know, I, you know, I, I'm, as a, you know, I'm just more exposed to, you know, the stocks that I can see bouncing around all the valuations and the, I'm um, just curious to have, See how that sort of reacts in a, in the private world, especially in like these small startup. Uh, your your question is around investor sentiment. Yeah, well, just you, you seem to be alluding to you know some maybe detachment from sanity or <laughs> um, uh, you know the, the, some aspect of like uh, over overly optimistic. And I'm just curious if there differs in in the way people yeah. think and how bubbles form also in private capital. Pools. You know what? That's a great question. I'm going to touch on it in the next two to three slides, but, but that's exactly where I'm going with this. Great. Was there another question? Yeah, I had one. Yeah. So um, I would say like public markets were young, wild, and free, like in 2020 and 20, like beginning of 2021. Um, and, and now they, they've seemed to like be coming back to reality. Um, like a lot of, of uh, young tech stocks are getting destroyed. Um, bad SPACs are like down 80% for some of them. I think like I read a stat that last week that um, there's like 40% of, of uh, NASDAQ companies that are down like over 50% or maybe I'm switching the numbers around, but like um, public markets are really like hard right now for, for tech companies. And I'm still seeing like these, these huge fundraising rounds at crazy multiples in private markets. So I'm wondering what's the delay between like um, public valuations and private valuations. Are VCs still like doing these rounds to not ruin the, the, the relationships with founders? And then like in a month or so, like once all the like existing um, round, like rounds that were, that were getting raised while the public markets were getting destroyed. Once that's passed, like then the, the, the VC market's gonna freeze if public markets keep on going like this. So um, uh, Jiro, you, you may have some thoughts here too. I'll take a quick stab at answering this one with, with a few thoughts of my own. Um, number one, yes, there's a delay between public and, and private markets. So the private markets right now are very on edge about what's happening in the public markets. We haven't seen the impact yet. Um, but we are expecting to see it. Um, why is there a delay? I would say um, number one is in private markets, capital is typically committed. Um, most funds have a, a, a finite life and that capital is committed upfront. So most venture funds are 10 years in length. You have a four to five year investment period, and then you have a five to six year Kind of nurturing or harvesting period where you actually work with the companies, generate value, sit on boards and hope to exit. All of the capital for the entire 10 years is committed at time zero. And so you don't actually, if, if there are adjustments in, in markets um, and if capital is being pulled out of the sector, that capital has already been committed to tech funds. And so those tech funds still have the, um, the responsibility and the ability to, to deploy that capital. One, one additional point that I'll add, which is an almost commonly held notion in, in the venture market. And if you listen to some podcasts with people like Peter Fenton and, and others, you'll hear this concept, which is if you look back on the last 20 or 30 years of venture, it is impossible to time the market. And what most venture funds try to do is they try to deploy capital in every market cycle, both at the large ups and the highest valuations and at the large downs and the lowest valuations. And they've actually found, if you look back at data, that some of the, the best companies and the best exits in venture funds were actually built in, in these extreme market conditions, either the extreme highs or the extreme lows. And so what venture funds don't like doing is like skipping a year because there's a bit of volatility. They wanna deploy in every type of market cycle. So this year, and if it looks completely different in 2023, they'll want to deploy an equivalent amount of capital then to make sure that they have essentially no exposure to the market, that they've deployed evenly across all years. So because of the capital being committed up front and because of that desire for spreading exposure, we do see the delay of, of that effect into the private markets. Jiro, I don't know if you have 
anything to add? Yeah, I mean, generally speaking, I agree with everything you said. I, I might ac actually add another thing. Uh, and the statement I'm going to make is going to be maybe sharper than, than, than what you actually see in practice. Um, but I wouldn't just think about um, delayed reaction vis-a-vis -vis the public market. Um, I would also, I, I also find it interesting within the private market to talk about the extent of the correlation uh, between what's happening in the public market and what's happening in the private market. And, and one kind of fact uh, that I would like to point our attention to is the fact that like not all startups correlate with the market the same way. Uh, and in particular, there's one sharp contrast or whatever sharp, uh, there's one contrast, which is early stage versus late stage. The late stage will wiggle with the public market more than the early stage um, because the late stage is getting close to exit and the way it will exit will be in line with the public market. So those tend to wiggle more. So when the, mark, the public market is frothy, you'll tend to have more of an increase in the frothiness of the late stage. Um, and you'll see more wiggling in terms of the valuations in the late stage. Whereas like an early stage startup that is like realistically, um, you know, five to 10 years away from an exit, um, the valuations there, they will wiggle. So it's not like there's no, co no correlation, but they won't wiggle as much unless you have a tremendous influx of capital. Um, there has been a tremendous influx of capital from institutional investors of new types and more aggressive allocations from LPs in recent times. So you've had, you have seen an increase, a fairly dramatic, and a never seen before increase in the valuations of early stage stuff, um, you know, which you know, may or may not be uh, worrisome. Uh, but you know, most of the time when you don't have that tremendous influx in capital, um, you have less correlation in the valuations of early stage uh, with, uh, with the overall uh, market conditions. It tends to resemble more valuations over a longer horizon than over a current snapshot in time. Um, because it's tough to predict when this company exits in five or 10 years, whether the market will still have high valuation multiples or not. And so you tend to see more wiggle um, in terms of say, uh, you know, uh, uh, like valuation multiples from private funding rounds, I think in the late stage than in the early stage. Um, so that's another thing to, to think about as well. And so sometimes the early stage might look like it even like has a more exaggerated delay, but it's not so much a delay, it's just less of a correlation. Um, again, this might be a particularly special moment in time where you even have a correlation in the early stage. Um, but yeah, would you generally agree with that statement, uh, Alex? Yeah, no, that's a great point. It actually feeds into my next slide, um, but I saw another question up. Hi, I had a question. I know like Theranos and um, obviously as we work, it's getting crazy in the States and the SEC is looking into like implementing more regulation. I'm just wondering on that note, what's happening in Canada? Um, is it as wild and free here and um, regulation wise what's happening here? Yeah, um, is it as wild and free? Yes, um, the, the geographical borders essentially for venture capital are broken down. Every deal in Canada that I competed on in the last few years, I was competing with US firms. So they are uh, one of the strategies when markets get competitive is to look in different places, right? And so you've already seen the decoupling of this like Silicon Valley as the only place in the world where companies exist. Um, companies are getting backed in other geographies more than they ever have before by venture capitalists. Um, in terms of regulations, it's a, it's a very difficult uh, answer. Um, that's something that we, you know, we can all do more research on. In the case of, in the case of Theranos, um, for those who aren't familiar, it's the company that promised to take your blood, um, blood tests at home or inside Walgreens. They actually rolled out machines inside Walgreens um, for blood testing and all this kind of stuff. It turned out the entire science behind it was bullshit um, and that she essentially had faked the science to raise venture capital. Um, and that's part of what Jiro talked about before is like, how do you keep de-risking things and resolving uncertainty so that you can reach your next milestone and raise more capital? Well, they couldn't, they couldn't reach the uncertainty or de-risk it. So they faked that um, in order to continue and then it flywheels from there. Um, which is By the way, essentially, maybe, yeah. maybe I'll add one little thing, you know, this speaks also to the value of, uh, 
of uh, industry experts. I can give you a little anecdote. Um, when I was first being asked to develop this course, actually, before uh, I actually started lecturing to you, Alex, um, I actually talked about Theranos to uh, one of my old roommates from college, who is a, uh, uh, a medical school professor uh, at UC San Francisco. And so we ended up talking about Theranos and him and his wife who's also uh, a medical school professor. They both were like, look, um, seems exciting. And there seems to be a lot of hype around this. We, for the life of us, do not understand how this technology can work. And then they broke down the whole process of blood testing at a first principles level to me and tied it to statistics. The volume of blood you have, blood is like a data set, less volume, smaller data set. How the fuck can you learn a lot with less data? Um, and I mean, it turns out that they were right. So, you know, sometimes it's useful to like rely on experts for due diligence who actually understand who are like real doctors, right? So in any case, so I just thought I would mention that. The, the really difficult thing here from a regulatory perspective is everything that Theranos did and everything that WeWork did, their boards signed off on. <laughs> and that's the really puzzling piece here from a founder of VC thing is Adam Newman was personally investing cash inside WeWork properties. He was getting paid out from WeWork properties. He was getting super voting agreements where despite only owning 10 or 20 percent, he voted for 80 percent of the shareholders. He was, um, you know, in doing side deals with people. He actually owned the WeWork trademark himself on his personal name. All of the things I just mentioned, his board signed off on. His board composed of Benchmark and Excel and uh, SoftBank signed those documents authorizing all those things to happen. So this was... Um, going back to my point at the top, why are these companies investing with zero due diligence? They didn't due diligence the company. They didn't look under the hood. They didn't go and evaluate Theranos' uh, technology or science. And that's because of that's a, that's a result of the crazy competitive market that we're in. If you don't sign a term sheet in three days, you lose the deal because someone else is going to do it. If you ask too many questions, you lose the deal because someone else was asking less questions. And so um, it's, it's puzzling from a regulatory standpoint to answer because legally all those things went through a formal board of directors and the board of directors didn't uphold their fiduciary responsibility to the company. Um, and we can dig in more in our, in our board session on, on some of those uh, topics and responsibilities of a board and how some of that stuff happens. Um, I'd be going into the next slide and I'll move through this quick. Like the reason why you see Fidelity and T. Rowe Price and Goldman Sachs investing in early stage companies is it's very obvious. They were missing these returns in the public sector. Um, if you look at the returns of mutual funds for Fidelity, they were underperforming the market and they started moving, moving pieces of their asset allocation strategy into different asset classes. If you look at Sequoia, Silver Lake, SoftBank and how much they made off just a couple of deals here. I mean, Sequoia made $16 billion off the Airbnb and DoorDash IPOs this year. Um, this returns many funds, right? Like they, Sequoia raises a fund of maybe a billion or $2 billion. They return $16 billion in capital to their limited partners from just the IPOs in the last 18 months. That, that doesn't account for all the other deals that they did. Um, just these four companies that they invested in. Um, these returns people were missing out on. And so you see more people crowd into the market as returns like this emerge. Um, these are the companies that I mentioned. I mean, we talk to all of these companies at Reno Run for our fundraise um, and we're like a series B stage company. And we're still talking to the likes of, you know, Silver Lake and folks that have billions of dollars on their, on their balance sheet. Um, what does it, this mean? It means cash is a commodity. Um, that's the point I'm trying to get at here is that you are not going to differentiate yourself based on cash. Um, you, this is not uh, the world of VC is not the Dragon's Den or the Shark Tank where you sit in your chair and you listen to founders and you decide which one you want to back. It's actually the complete reverse. Every deal that I want to back, I have to fight for. I have to convince the entrepreneur why I'm the best person for them. Every meeting with the founder is an opportunity for me to sell myself and for me to tell them about everything that I'm going to do for them over the next decade of working together. Um, so when cash is a commodity, what do VCs do? And when the market is so competitive, what do VCs do? We can talk about a few things here, but we've, all, we've, all, we've talked about almost all of these. They invest earlier. So you see companies like, like what I just mentioned come all the way down the stack and start investing in Series A and Series B stage companies. 
a lot of the hype these days is around a fund called Tiger Global that I've gotten the pleasure of getting to know recently. Um, and you can do a lot of research on Tiger. This was a hedge fund. Um, they did not operate in private markets much at all. Um, they were mostly only public uh, market investors. They're a multi-billion dollar hedge fund. All of a sudden they're leading seed rounds. Like they're literally backing products that don't exist. Companies with zero revenue, founding teams that haven't even been working together for two years. So you've gone from a, a hedge fund investing in, in large publics all the way down to backing you know, two guys and a goat, as, as uh, one of our partners used to say. Um, what else do they, what else can um, venture capital firms do? Um, they can find and invest in other deal flow magnets. So when it's competitive, venture funds will actually invest in other venture funds. Um, they'll invest in smaller venture funds that might bring them deal flow. They're inve they'll invest in scouts, um, entrepreneur and residents that come in with an existing network of entrepreneurs. So they attach themselves to these magnets. And it's a little bit about what Jiro was talking about before with the talent strategy is like, how do you find these people that have this magnetic um, network or this, they're the nucleus of this network? And how do you bring those people closer to you? It's exactly what venture funds do. They go and they find those magnets for talent and entrepreneurs, and they try to bring them in either as partners, as advisors, as venture partners, as scouts. They try to incentivize them to bring them deals. Um, What's another thing they can do? They can loosen the criteria for what a tech company is. And we've seen this all over the place. Everything is a tech company now. The new thing now is everything's a FinTech company <laughs> because it's such a hot category. Um, so they, uh, in the past, it was venture funds. If you look in the, the, the bubble of like the 2000s when it was like the dot-com bubble. And then from then it was all software and mobile. It had to be a SaaS company. You had to have 80% margins. You had to be building real software. Now anything can pass. You can be a real estate company. You can be a mattress. Um, anything, depending on the way the founder sells the story, can be a tech company. Um, another thing VCs do is they create value-added services. Um, my experience with value-added added services is it's mostly bullshit. Um, VCs will create this as a marketing tactic, right? We're going to source the we're going to source you talent. Um, we're going to help you with your M and A strategy. We're going to help you with. Um, X, Y, Z. If you, if you read most, v, most credible VC blogs on Twitter and you, um, you follow some prominent VCs, most founders pick a venture capitalist because of the person that they're going to be working with and because of the relationship that they've built with that person. An entrepreneur doesn't typically rely on a venture firm to help them source talent or to help them evaluate something. Um, that's going to be a core competency of the founder and the CEO in most cases. Um, number five, pay more. So valuations go up in competitive markets um, and move quicker. Um, when, I, when I left Inovia, we were doing deals in one day. Um, we'd get a, a partner pitch and uh, we would decide immediately after the partner pitch if we were moving forward and we would issue a term sheet or not. Um, but it was, we knew that if we waited even three or four days to complete our due diligence, we were gonna lose the deal. Um, and so you needed to find earlier and earlier signals and you needed to be able to do more work in advance of in advance of actual fundraises if you were going to stand any chance at making a decision. Um, and number six is enhanced data-driven sourcing capabilities. So how do you, as I just said, find people earlier and how do you find people that otherwise aren't crossing your desk? So we could, ex we could spend an entire class exploring each one of these six things. Um, and a lot of these things will come back up in other sections of the course. Um, and the, the fundamental concept here um, that I think is worth sharing, which is like the number one rule of VC, is that it's a power law. And what does this mean? It means that 6% of the deals produce over 60% of the returns, and more than half of the deals lose money. Um, and if you look at, if you compare that with like top funds, um, this is the same report here from Andreessen Horowitz, but funds have have most funds have about the same number of wins uh, as they do losses. Um, so again, it's the same stat that about half of your companies basically go bankrupt and are written off to zero uh, as an investor. And the other half have to make up for all the ones that went bankrupt and way more. And so that's what the, that's what the power law means, which is like, if I do 10 deals as a venture capitalist, Chances are my for, like my my deal number one and two in that ranking are going to generate all of the return. 
Um, this is not a strategy, a venture capital firm is not a strategy where you want to um, expect returns from every company and try to equally weight them and try to take appropriate risk and all that kind of stuff. You want to swing for the fences with every single deal that you do um, because you need to find the winner. Um, one, one thing I might, I might add as a caveat here is that the statements uh, that Alex made, I agree with. I would say they're more representative of early stage investing yes. than true like late stage investing. Like early part, early part of growth stage, that's still somewhat true. But like the, the very late stage, like these, the, the power law thing is no longer, like you're a little bit more defensive with your investment strategy there. Correct. Great, great call out, Jero. I think it's actually important as we go through the course that we do call out the differences in early and growth stage investing. My experience is largely with early stage investing. And so you'll see a lot of my data bias towards that. Um, but in early stage investing, it's actually fully rational to back a founder like Adam Newman. It's fully rational to back a mattress company like Casper. It's fully rational to back the wackiest person you've ever met taking on uh, you know, building a blood testing company that they're going to roll out through Walgreens, because those are the outliers. You need to invest in outliers that are going to generate the massive return. You can't just, in, you can't just invest in a conservative portfolio of, of, you know, moderate companies. All this to say, so everything up to here to say that the primary relation, the primary role of a venture capitalist is to be a deal flow magnet. That is responsibility number one. And I may actually simplify this sentence and say like a talent magnet, um, back to Jiro's point, which is like, it's all about the people that you're meeting and the people that you can convince to like you and spend time with you. Um, your responsibility is to find the deal, like the one deal. Um, and in order to find the one deal, you've got to meet a lot of people and you've got to invest in more than one deal and you've got to spend time with more than one company. But it's all about finding that one big hit. And if you're a venture capitalist and you find the one big hit, it completely transforms your career. Um, what you need to be able to do to achieve this is locate incredible entrepreneurs. Like, where are they? How do I get in touch with them? How do I find them? How do I meet them? Um, number two is like, how do I get these people to care about me and build relationships with me? How do I add value to them? How do I like, how do I figure out what they want and, and, and try to give that to them? And how do I convince them to want to work with me over every other person that they're speaking to? Um, these are really difficult things to do. Um, really, really difficult. Um, and so you need to be focused and, and focus on doing it with a small subset uh, to start with and build that as a skill. So one, one more slide here, and then maybe we could just end with five minutes of questions or, or thoughts if anybody has it. We can go back into this at, a, at another lecture. And I think maybe what we'll do is we'll go back into this as we introduce the talents or the, uh, the sourcing project in a couple of weeks to give you a few more tips and tricks on, on what it looks like to source a deal. These are some early, like there's six ideas here for you. And I would say, learn these in the context of the sourcing project. You should try a few of these things for the sourcing project. And you should try things that aren't on this list as well for the sourcing project. Um, Number one is, is very simple, which is like use data. So figure out what you're looking for, build some filters and criteria and roll out those filters and criteria across the web. Um, I would spend a lot of time doing this as a venture capitalist. I would have, you know, 25 active projects on LinkedIn trying to find people that met different um, criteria and very specific criteria. I'd be looking for somebody in a certain region that had previously worked at a certain company whose title said, um, uh, you know, stealth mode or building something new or who was a previous executive at a Canadian, you know, top 10 tech company. Like there's very specific filtering criteria you can use to identify really high quality people and actually build like long lists and data sets that you can say, okay, here's people I'm going to build a relationship with over the next couple of years. Um, a second approach is to actually build an investment thesis. And the genesis of this approach is what I call focus. Um, it's impossible to try to go out into the market and meet every single entrepreneur. So what do you do? You focus on something that you can get smart at quickly. Um, I did this in my third year at Inovia. I just decided that I wanted to back a company working in the fertility space. Um, there's a growing trend in fertility where people are waiting until older and older to have children. 
And as you wait until you get older, your chances of infertility actually jump significantly. And so we have a growing population of infertile, um, uh, infertile couples looking to have children. So I backed a company in San Francisco called Future Family, which actually offers financing for IVF. So it allows couples to get access to capital um, because it's usually not something that's covered by insurance. What I did was I started with this macro thesis of fertility is an issue. I went and I found data points on what this means and how this market evolves over the next five years. I identified 10 companies that were working on fertility. I went and met all 10 of them. And then I identified the two or three that I thought were really, really interesting and started building relationships there. So that's a, that's a sourcing strategy that revolves around getting smart on something very specific and focused. And then a couple of, of these other ones we've already discussed, which is attending events physically or virtually and networking with the right people, speaking to all the people on Jiro's list, investors, operators, LPs, a bunch of different people that are gonna naturally bring you ideas. Explore hubs of smart people like accelerators and universities. Um, and another thing that VC firms do, which we'll touch on in another lecture, is if you don't, if you do a whole exercise on sourcing and you have a smart thesis that you think about and you go out and you don't find anything, start it yourself. And VC funds will, will start companies themselves and actually plug in their own staff or hire management teams and run those businesses. And there's been some extremely successful tech companies that have actually been started inside venture funds based on them being not capable of sourcing that deal. Um, so this is not an exhaustive list. It's a list of ideas and stuff that I wish we had more time to dig into on a one-by-one -one basis. Um, but um, we can revisit some of this stuff and I can help answer questions or dig into any of this stuff as you're working on your sourcing project. Any thoughts on that, Jiro? Um, no, I mean, I think uh, I agree with everything you said. And I, know, I see that we're kind of uh, getting close to the end point of time for the session. Um, one thing that seems to have happened is I don't think we'll have time to talk about preparing you guys a little bit for next week's session. But um, is Samuel still here? Um, let's see. He is not. Um, so... <laughs> That's good. Um, so maybe we're not going to get a Slack channel because I was going to say, hey, if the Slack channel is up, maybe we can uh, we can have a little bit of a discussion there. Um, well, OK, uh, we will see about that one. Um, OK, I was really banking on Samuel still being here uh, when I started saying this, um, but like maybe, OK, don't hesitate as you prepare for this session, you can shoot Alex and I emails. Uh, um, oh, well, it's, it might be tough if we start to get 40 emails. The, the, um, readings, the readings that we put there as recommended readings by Bill Gurley are really, are, will be very helpful for that session. It, they're going to summarize it a hell of a lot better than I'm going to summarize it. Um, I, I think that like while we're not saying there's required readings, like in absence of us having the opportunity to discuss it today, I strongly recommend those readings. It'll take 15 minutes. Uh, by the way, in general, like Bill Gurley, yet another benchmark person. Um, I guess he retired recently. That's right, right? Yeah. yeah. So like, um, but like his blog posts are gold. They're probably the most quality per unit of blog posts, full stop by a large margin. Um, so, you know, th those are great readings. There's a lot of other Bill Gurley readings that I've found super helpful in my own course development. And I think a lot of, uh, a lot of both startup founders and uh, investors uh, have found extremely helpful as well. Uh, but yeah, so highly recommend that you guys read that stuff. Do some homework on Joel as well. By the way, uh, the Joel session is gonna be a little bit different than most of our sessions um, because uh, despite the fact that he was uh, for a short period of time, Alex's hockey coach, um, neither of us know him professionally well. Um, out of, he is the only person that we're having as a guest speaker um, this semester that neither one of us knows personally. Um, um, and so he's a little bit of a wild card. He was, he was uh, recommended to us by the alumni development office. Um, so look, he's definitely very knowledgeable in his space and has uh, you know, an outlier level of experience with, uh, with, uh, with SPACs. Um, but that's one where even Alex and I feel like we don't know exactly how, like for a lot of the other conversations, we kind of feel more confident in how it's going to go than with this one. So, you know, expect maybe a bit of a wild card. 
read up on him a little bit um, uh, would be helpful. Um, yeah, so that's that would be a little bit of a word of advice. So read up on those materials, read up on the person. I mean, in general, that statement holds true for any session for you guys, because you guys won't know any of them personally. Um, so hopefully that's a little bit of useful guidance. If you guys have real pertinent questions, you can email Alex and I, and we'll, we'll div divvy up the responding or something like that. We'll try our best, let's put it that way. Uh, but hopefully the session seemed interesting to everyone. I think we can wrap up the session, but if anyone wants to ask some questions post session, uh, I'm happy to stick around a little bit longer. Uh, Alex, don't want to speak for you, but uh, I've got a few minutes if there's any, if there's yeah. any questions. So if an, any questions, great. Um, you know, and to those who are about to pop out uh, again, you know, uh, good luck making your decision on whether you think this is the right course for you. Um, and we hope to see you again uh, uh, next week. So have a good evening, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Hi, Professor Barrett. I was wondering if I could actually ask you a quick question. Oh, please don't call me that. Oh, uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, don't, Alex? Don't, don't call me <laughs> Professor Kondo either. I don't like it either. Um, oh, yeah, sorry. I've been addressing you, can, you that way in emails. Um, you can call me Alex. Alex. Yeah. Okay. I was just wondering, so in your, at your current firm, you said it was like e-commerce for construction materials. I was wondering if you guys were planning in the future to move on to like the end of the life cycle as well. I think it's like 30% of construction uh, materials are wasted after a project. And like, that's like a pretty big area to capitalize on. So I was just like interested in whether you guys would maybe focus on that in the future as well, or if you already we, were. We actually offer free returns. So what we'll do is we'll, we'll say like order as much as you need and whatever you don't use, we'll come by and pick up at the end of the week or at the end of the project. So we, we actually do try to minimize the waste on the, on the job site as much as possible. What we're not doing a good job yet of is actually measuring that. Um, so I need to be able, like for our next fundraise, I would love to have a slide on, on the actual data point behind what waste reduction we contribute to. Okay, awesome, thank you. Good thought though, that's a, yeah, good, good, uh, good advice. Any, any other questions? Yeah, I just had a, a quick question about a point that uh, I think two of you made at the end of the lecture about how early stage um, firms mostly go for like these outsized outlier returns, which is why a deal can get done in one day. Uh, and then Jiro, you mentioned that like late stage um, investment firms generally have more information, doesn't really go like that. Is that reflected? Like do those, uh, when you look at like the performance of VCs, like do early stage, do those outliers, correlates like a really high return over time compared to like uh, later stage, less risky um, investment firms, if that makes sense. I mean, the like the mean return is not the same thing as the spread of returns. Um, uh, so what I will say that is definitely clear in the data is that the spread in returns between the top quartile and bottom quartile of early stage focused VC funds, that spread is larger. Than, than the late stage funds. Um, the mean, um, it's a little bit trickier to say because there's so much noise. Um, um, so it's tougher and it's also like, it's important to also say that the definition of what is late stage has fundamentally changed in the last, um, in the last 15 years in the sense that there's been a, a stretching out of the life cycle of a startup while it still remains private. And so like late stage has gotten later and later and later where there's companies that in the, in, you know, before the dot-com bubble burst um, would have gone public and that for an extended period of time, we're not going public. Um, and so what that means is you've got like a new category of late stage that has very little, you know, past history because it's kind of new. And so it's too early to say too much about the mean return there. Um, um, mean returns are much more difficult to, to provide convincing aggregate data on uh, than, than variances. Uh, so that's part, of the that's part of the trickiness there as well. So I would focus more on spread uh, okay. than on mean. There's some evidence that the mean is, is, is higher, but it's, it's, it's not the, 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 the more long-term evidence on um, difference in mean return between the early stage and the late stage. The early stage is a little bit higher. Uh, it's not as much higher as you might think but that's not necessarily actually a bad thing either because variance is not the same thing as uh, systematic risk. 
and there's a lot of early stage stuff that that, that is uh, arguably diversifiable. Um, but uh, um, but yeah, um, definitely uh, are some uh, documentable differences, but we can't document every single wrinkle of difference uh, that we would want to. Cool, thank uh, you. I don't know if you want to add something, Alex. Any other questions? Um, for me, it's a, a bit unrelated to class, but um, uh, Alex, if it's if it's uh, okay with you, you mentioned earlier that um, um, that you believe you can you have a good outlook on career and career advice, and I'm I'm at my last semester now, so uh, I would love the option, if possible, to uh, not now, of course, but to, to kind of talk to you about it. Um, sure. And yeah. Send send me an email and we'll book some time. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, no worries. Um, I actually have a small question. Um, Alex, you, you were talking about like very briefly about soft uh, SoftBank while talking about WeWork. And like I kind of read some other weird bets that they've made like recently. And like I know there was like a, a financial institution in Australia that went badly. And they were like really close to SoftBank as well. And I was wondering, like, I know that the CEO is very much respected and he's constructed like a, a huge, huge bank in Japan, which, which is like amazing. But is there something wrong? It's really open as a question, but like, that's, is there something wrong with their like investments or their client relationships sometimes as a bank? I don't know if you have like a, an opinion on that. Yeah, so so I think we can talk about SoftBank a lot in the class. Um, I'm 99% sure that we're going to have somebody from SoftBank come to a, to a guest lecture. So we can real and he he just left SoftBank. Um, he's actually a McGill grad, and so we can. It's actually good that he just left because we can dig in and peel back the layers of of what's going on there. He was there during the WeWork stuff, so um, he's a friend of mine uh, who's uh, who's doing his MBA at Stanford right now and is a Montrealer, um, but he spent four years at SoftBank, I think. So uh, what I'd say is I have some intuitions there, but let's uncover that subject as we go through the class. Um, in short, they went and raised a hundred billion dollars from a mixture of, you know, uh, Middle Eastern governments, um, you know, a whole bunch of banks and, and, and non-traditional investors in this category. And then they went out and they made a whole bunch of extremely, um, extremely risky investments with billions of dollar checks. So to Jiro's point around, like, when you said what I was saying is mostly early stage, Yes, except for SoftBank, because they treat $5 billion checks like early stage deals. <laughs> and it's, uh, it's, it's quite a different strategy. So I'm looking forward, well, let's unpack that as, as we go through. Um, as you guys online, I can I go next? So I know you mentioned this during the lecture at some point where you were talking about the risk of maybe like investing too much in a specific a project or like a specific uh, sector that is hot at the moment with it like changing next year. So like what like venture capitals do is that this year they invest the same pharmacy because of COVID and the next year they will bet in the next big thing. So like they kind of like uh, balance the risk of like things changing. Uh, but like I was wondering how the, exactly it works because the underlying risk of each sector is different, right? And the amount of capital that you invest in one sector and then you can lose is completely different and the risk like changes depending of like the sector or like whatever type of investment you're making and if I remember correctly last semester in Jiro's class for ICF we were trying to like um kind of like duplicate whatever investment we make in order to like prevent any underlying risk coming off uh with the black trust model and he say like there's limits even to that does it like really apply to venture when like like the risk is even greater because yes, there is more flexibility, but it's also like really hard to like, kind of like forecast how much income or how much profit you can get from something. On the first part of that question about, um, and, and if I understand the question correctly, it's um, you're asking, yes, they might market smooth by investing in every cycle of the market, but if they're jumping from category to category, depending on what's hot, that they're actually not getting the full value of diversification. Um, 
I think that's that's a valid point. Uh, what I would say is that most tech funds are general generalist tech funds. They spread across a variety of sectors and they invest in long-term trends. You'll see most of them only investing in software, mobile, um, and social over the last two decades. That's basically where they've placed all their bets. When an event like COVID happens, you actually didn't see VCs running towards um, COVID spike related deals. You saw them evaluating what long-term trends have we just entered as a result of this short-term, well, not short-term anymore, but short-term market blip. And then they'll go and they'll start backing the long-term trends. For example, um, you know, digital communication and you know, digital classrooms and meetings and all that kind of stuff. That that like work from home and study from home is something that people envision for decades. That the world has changed, regardless of whether COVID is still around or not. The world has changed in the way we work, and so you'll see VCs that will will try to take short-term data points and piece together what a long-term outlook. Because don't forget that it's a 10 year fund. This company is not going to exit for a decade. Um, so they, they do try to forecast very, very long term type of companies rather than responding to short term market market blips. Yeah, I mean, in some sense, building on what um, Alex said um, is like when you have events like this, um, you, you want to think about like the obvious opportunities versus the more subtle opportunities. And the more subtle opportunities usually think less about what is directly obvious around the event, but more about like, well, this event is going to impact or accelerate some big trends that have been on our radar before, where we kind of know the players in this space. And because now it's been accelerated, timelines are more interesting now, and maybe things are ready for investment or ready to accelerate growth. Um, and so it's kind of more of a... Um, uh, thinking uh, so like thinking about the more subtle opportunities that surround these events or same thing like when when the market is hot you don't necessarily just invest in the hot stuff that everyone else is investing you try to find the stuff that despite the hotness is a bit ignored at the mar at the relative margin right so for instance you know think of another big trigger um you know um this thing, this thing gets invented, right? Um, you know, a lot of people see this thing getting invented and they're like, oh, you know, let's, uh, let's invest in app developers who will make, uh, you know, versions of software that exists on a computer uh, for this. Um, well, that was obvious to everyone. Uh, everyone invested in that. Um, and actually probably the returns there were not that spectacular, you know, despite, despite the, the, the smartphone wave. But the more interesting returns, we're thinking about when you get this device made, what are the things where there wasn't software for stuff before, but where that software is enabled by this? Think Uber, right? And stuff like that. Um, so you look for like, I mean, Bill Gurley likes to say like, look for the white space that is impacted by new technology triggers or new platform triggers where you've got important markets that you know the old version of whatever this was, computing or whatnot, couldn't service their needs, but this new version provides brand new things you can do with this capacity, um, right? And, and you'd be surprised how many people, like, because part of it is you need to imagine something that doesn't exist yet. And that's more difficult. Um, the best VCs try to think, think of things that way, more at a first principles level, what hasn't been done before, but that is now enabled by whatever is happening or is now accelerated by whatever is happening. Yeah, that makes sense. And as a short question, are you, because I'm also in your venture class, are you going to be tying up sometimes what we learn in the other class to the actual application in this class? Yeah, I mean, you know, like, in fact, some of the slides that I presented today, you will see carbon copies of them. In my yeah, I think course. you talk about part of it today in class. Yeah, yeah. So like, you know, there's gonna be some linkages. Uh, these are not the same course. They are very different. Uh, but I view them as being complementary. And in yeah. fact, when, when Alex and I were brainstorming on this course, a lot of the centering on the brainstorming is how can this course add material complementary value to the other course while still being valuable on a standalone basis? To, to both of us, it was important that the course achieve both of those objectives. Okay. Whether, we, whether we will deliver is a separate question, but fingers crossed. I hope so. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. Have a good night, everybody. Yeah, Alex, you want to for another couple of minutes?
Sure. Can I ask one question, like short question. Sure. Yeah. Oh yeah. Thank you guys. Good night. Uh, you. Bye bye. <laughs> Uh, Alex, you said like you invested in uh, personally to Reno Run, if, if I remember correctly, right? I invested oh, through Inovia, yeah. Uh, I through Inovia. Like, I like my question was the what makes the like. I'm sure like you had the other opportunities to invest other like, companies as well. I'm not sure if you have already, but what was like what was in the what made the difference for Reno Run that you committed yourself personally? It's, it's a lot of what we discussed tonight, which is chemistry with the founding team, um, mm -hmm. feeling like they are outlier individuals that can solve uh, difficult mm -hmm. problems and attract other quality people, elbow room in the market to be able to iterate in a massive space and find a business model that works, um, and excitement about the mission and purpose of the company. Mm -hmm. So it's um, th those, th those things very rarely align. They may sound simple, but after mm -hmm. meeting thousands of companies, it's a difficult mm -hmm. set of things to actually align in the same place. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Have a good one. Thanks, Yusin. Have, have a good evening.